Chapter 6, The One-to-One -one Meetings. At the very center of the model is this powerful strategy. Managers meet with their individual team members on a regular basis to discuss their progress and mentor them. With these discussions, managers can help each team member become a high-performing individual. And by doing the same with all of their team members, it helps the team become high-performing. Below, we discuss how to have great one-on-one -on -one meetings, how often, what to discuss in them, and the tools to use. So first, how long and how often should the one-on-ones be? Managers and supervisors tend to not want to have these meetings very frequently because they don't know what to discuss so often and they don't know how to structure the meetings. A good one-on-one -on -one meeting should take 30 to 45 minutes. Anything less than 30 minutes, you're probably not given sufficient time for the things that need to be discussed. The basic rule of thumb on how often managers should have one-on-ones with each of their team members is at least once per month, but preferably once per week or bi-weekly. The reason we say preferably once per month or bi-weekly, it is because the speed of the business, the speed of problems, the routine of life happens on a weekly basis. Things happen on a regular weekly basis, and the sooner the manager gets ahead of things every week, the faster the manager can provide direction, give answers, help, assist, and provide solutions. And the more you meet weekly, the more you can keep them within 30 minutes. How about giving feedback on their progress? In the same spreadsheet template we have provided earlier, go to sheet number five and find the sheet titled Progress Tracker or Scorecard, which is shown in page 33 in template four. Column A of the spreadsheet shows the areas that the team members are doing well and those they're making progress on and those that they need lots of improvement urgently. In columns B through Q, you would score them as follows. You enter a three for those things they're doing great performance and it automatically turns to green. You score them a two for those things that they're doing good improvement, but they need to get to higher performance. The spreadsheet automatically becomes yellow. You score them a one for low performance or lots to improve, and the cell becomes red automatically. The template turns red, yellow, or green automatically as you enter these numbers. The goal is to help them get to green in all their areas. Now it's time to discuss problems and obstacles. Every team member is facing challenges, obstacles, and issues that could be hindering their performance, and they need to talk with their manager about these things. The one-on-one -on -one meetings are the place to discuss these things because they know that the manager has dedicated time to talk about anything and everything. In the same spreadsheet that we have provided, take a look at the sheet titled Problems, Issues, and Tasks, which looks like the diagram in the middle of page 34. In column A, you enter the date of when you discuss the issue. Column B is the actual issue or problem. Column C is where you enter what the team member is requesting, and column D is the possible solution. In column E and F, you track its completion and when it was completed. This becomes like a shared to-do list to listen to each other and tackle issues together. This is why you need 30 minutes on a weekly basis to track all this. So what else to discuss? In your one-on-one -on -one meetings, you would also discuss the tool spreadsheet, the training spreadsheet, and the expectation spreadsheet. You discuss these, you update them, and track these things together each week or every other week. There is no shortage of the things that you discuss in your one-on-one -on -one meetings. By discussing these, you also identify problems, challenges, and you prioritize things together. You get on the same page. So what's next? In Chapter 7, we provide an insightful and even more powerful strategy on the importance of how to develop team leaders within your team which is a secret for high-performance teams. In Chapter 8, we cover some frequently asked questions about these topics, and in Chapter 9, we close with a call to action. Chapter 7, Developing Team Leaders. In this chapter, we dissect a powerful and effective strategy that goes to the heart of how to build and how to sustain high-performance teams. Unfortunately, not too many managers and companies take advantage of it. The strategy is simple. It is this, build the first follower, within the team and foster that person to be the team leader to help you rally the rest of the team to greatness. The best person for this role is the one who the other team members already consider to be their de facto leader anyway. Ironically, team members listen to their peer leaders better than to their own managers. They tend to take their lead better than they will of the managers and supervisors. Here's how to do it. In his 2010 TED Talk, Derek Sivers popularized the theory of the first follower and explained that although the leader of a group, the manager, is influential, it is not until that behavior is emulated by the first follower, the team leader within the ranks, that the others in the team are catalyzed into action. The strategy is to develop first a first follower 
and then having the others follow the first follower, not necessarily the manager. Cerberus explained it in this very short three minute video on the link that's provided for you on page 37. You can listen to the video or read the transcript on the next page in the book. Then we will dissect this with lessons at the end. So for those of you that are listening to this podcast or to this audio file, you won't see what's being described. So you'll eventually have to go to YouTube, go to page 37, type in the link and watch the video itself. But here is what the video says. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. All right, so what are the lessons to develop from the first follower? First, as the manager, be easy to follow. Don't change things all the time. Be predictable. Number two, when the first follower starts following, the manager should welcome, embrace, and nurture that person as an equal. Let others see you treat that person as an equal. Number three, support the first follower when others begin to follow. Don't make it about you, the leader. Number four, Foster that person to rally the team and make everything clearly about the movement and how everyone is following the first leader, about the first follower, not about how the people are to follow you. Do not compete against the first follower. The way to find a first follower is to watch and listen. Is there anyone in the team that is often trying to talk to you on behalf of the other team members? That's a clear sign that they see themselves as the de facto leader and a sign that the other team leader members also see this individual as the likely person to be their leader. Nurture that. If that person can in turn help rally others to action, there it is. That's your first follower. That's the team leader. Now, continue nurturing that. Chapter 8. Frequently Asked Questions. In this section, we will cover these frequently asked questions. Number one, should we use job descriptions? Number two, who should update the job descriptions? 
Number three, when should we use PIPs or performance improvement programs? Number four, how to handle toxic performers? Number five, shouldn't we recruit the best of the best candidates? And number six, should we hire for attitude or for skill? Number one, Shouldn't we use job descriptions? Of course, yes, we should. Job descriptions are foundational and should be the governing document that defines the position, its responsibilities, and scope of authority. The template of tools, training, and expectations should match the job description. Now, who should update the job descriptions? Well, the employees ideally should maintain their job descriptions updated throughout the year, promoting accurate role definition, effective communication, and facilitating performance evaluations and career development. This practice contributes to a more agile and adaptable organizational structure. When should we use PIPs or performance improvement plans? Performance improvement plans, PIPs, are often employed when an employee's performance is deemed inadequate making it seemingly too late to salvage their productivity. To enhance their effectiveness, we recommend transforming PIPs into ongoing coaching tools integrated throughout an employee's tenure, beginning at the beginning of their tenure, not on the back end. Regular feedback, goal setting, and skill development fosters a culture of continuous improvement. By proactively addressing performance concerns and issues, employees are more likely to succeed and grow, benefiting both the individual and the organization. This approach works better than using PIP, only when the employee needs rescuing, which is why we offered the scorecard at the early chapters of the book. Now, how to handle toxic performers. Employers should make every effort to address and rehabilitate top performers with negative attitudes or toxicity. However, if their attitude remains unchanged and continues to cause damage, it may be necessary to part ways, prioritizing the overall well-being of the organization over individual revenue contributions. Now, shouldn't we hire the best of the best candidates? While hiring highly top-skilled candidates is desirable, solely prioritizing technical expertise may lead to issues with teamwork and adaptability. Top-performing individuals, the best of the best, tend to find it difficult to learn new processes and be coachable. Strive instead to find a balance between high skills and collaborative attitude in your candidates to foster a healthy work environment and overall success. Should we hire for attitude or for skill? Definitely hire for attitude and coachability. A good skill employee with a positive attitude can become a high performer faster than trying to make a super skilled one coachable. Attitude and willingness to learn are crucial for long-term success and team cohesion. Chapter 9. On your marks, get set, go. In conclusion, remember that everything in this book is achievable and practical. I urge all managers, supervisors, and frontline employees to embrace coachability and actively listen to one another. Start the routine of regular meetings to discuss progress, address issues, and work collaboratively towards excellence. Moreover, recognize the significance of developing that first follower. That's a key catalyst to uniting and rallying the team to greatness. Together, Let's create a culture of support where we lift one another and achieve collective success. This journey towards excellence begins with each of us working together to accomplish remarkable transformations and reach new heights of success. Let's embark on this path united, growing, and thriving as a high-performance team. Wow!